So Anish spoke about running your company to actually running. If that first talk for today was anything to go by, you know at Unplugged we are talking about the basics of startups and building sustainable business without the gyan and the fancy metrics. Craftsvilla was launched in 2011 and almost had a near-death experience in 2012. And the company moved from five offices all over the country to a small one-room office. The team, which was 80 people in size, got downsized to just the passionate eight. Now that's a grim picture, isn't it? Picture this. Craftsvilla recently raised $34 million in Series C and is clocking 30 million monthly traffic and plans to attain $500 million in gross merchandise value over the next one years. From being written off to making it big, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Manoj Gupta, co-founder and CEO of Craftsvilla. Uh, I'm founder and CEO of Craftsvilla.com. I don't know how many of you know Craftsvilla.com, uh, but we are India's largest online marketplace for ethnic products. Uh, we only eat, sleep, and drink ethnic. Uh, you know, we don't think anything other than ethnic. Uh, ethnic is word for us. Uh, the journey of Craftsvilla.com is the journey I'm going to present. Uh, it's a journey of uh, interesting ups and downs. It's a journey of passion, it's a journey of focus, a journey of you know self-learning. Uh, you know, I have been an entrepreneur before I cra you know started Craftsvilla. I actually was a venture capitalist before I started, uh, you know, Craftsvilla. I was at Nexus Venture Partners. I was there for four years. And before Nexus, I was uh, in the U.S. Uh, started a tech company in San Diego, uh, sold it. I came back to India. Uh, so this was not my first journey, but uh, it was sort of my first entrepreneurial journey after, you know, coming out as a VC. My first uh, journey in India, uh, which always had a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting stuff, uh, I would say. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, just to just to recap, you know, we started in 2011 uh, when we first uh, started. Uh, actually, me and my wife both started it. Uh, we were on a trip to, you know. We used to travel a lot of villages, so one of the trip was in Kutch, you know, Kutch. I realized there's so much of supply lying around, the ethnic supply, that, that you know, no one is doing anything about it. You know? And uh, if you look at it, a marketplace, right? The way the marketplace works, the best is when you have a disaggregated supply and a disaggregated demand, right? If you have any concentration of anywhere, supply and demand marketplaces usually don't give you the benefit you want, right? And that's that basically was the trigger point. You know, hey, here so much, so much of ethnic supply lying around, um, and you know, India is so mainstream ethnic. You know, a lot of people actually, I still remember in 2011, a lot of people said, "What is ethnic? Why are you going to market? Is you know, who cares? You know, nobody understands. Who has built ethnic in the world, right?" Where, can you show us a replica of something in US, China, whatever, you know, where something like this has been created? And that's basically is the question I think all of the entrepreneurs get asked. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people will ask you questions, a lot of people will ask you, uh, you know, to say what is the pro and con and all that. Uh, ultimately, it's up to you, right? Uh, if you really believe in something, if you really believe this is opportunity and I can really crack it, and I can really create really big business, there's no one you should trust more than yourself. I think that's, that's, and once you have that trust in yourself that this is the journey I want to take, this is the journey I want to, you know, this four, five, ten years of my life is going to go in that, that helps you in the future journey of business. Believe me, no one has created a business where people have not come down. Everyone, every successful person will tell you they had their own lowest point, and then you need to turn around, right? So I think that basically is some of the things I would cover uh, in a talk. Uh, just to just to tell you a little bit about Craftsilla, uh, we currently, you know, 250 million 
plus valuation uh, last round. We have close to 4 million products. We are one of the near, very few e-commerce companies you will find we are near profitable e-commerce company. You will not hear about, uh, you know, from us like coupons or you know, discounts and those kind of stuff. Uh, we, we are a zero coupon company. We don't offer any coupons to our customer. Cust our value proposition to customer is simple. The, hey, here is what we want to provide you, the largest variety at lowest price. Uh, and, you know, you, you buy because you cannot get these products anywhere in the world, right? So, over, f over like half a million orders per month, we do uh, over, you know, uh, 30 million visits and we have raised like more than $50 million. Most of our funding uh, came in the last 12 months. Uh, we, from 2011, if you look at the timeline of the company, right? Uh, in 2011, we raised like $1.5 million, which is like pretty much a seed funding. Uh, when we first, uh, you know, raised it, uh, we, we, you know, when I was coming from VC background, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of things that you, take for granted a lot of things you do which is so unnatural in in the business right uh, so we were creating a natural demand we were like uh, giving a lot of discounts we are you know building a lot of big team pretty, pretty much building for the investors right uh, and that basically was the first slap i would say you know i personally got as an entrepreneur uh, don't build businesses for investors i think one of the worst thing you can do the business is build it for investors. And believe me, no investors want you to do that, that, they, that you build it for them, right? Uh, one of the tendencies, I think, uh, as we look at e-commerce, the tendency is to do a lot of things which are unnatural, right? Uh, in 2011 itself, uh, and I cannot agree more with Anish, you know, I, I wrote an article that e-commerce is a marathon. I personally have run two marathons. So I've you know, run five, five, half marathons. When you're doing something big, you know, when you're something, uh, uh, something long, right, uh, you really have to be very, very focused. You have, to, you have to do things which shouldn't divert your attention. You should be very, very focused. Right? Some, some of the things which Anish, you know, in the previous talk focused. So, so first, first year was the year of, I cannot tell you what chaos. Uh, you know, 100 people team. A lot of discount. We couldn't raise funding. You know, uh, unfortunately, we were at a time late, late 2011 when almost every VC ran away. You know, for funding e-commerce. So, uh, so, so 2012. Sorry, yeah. So 2012 basically we came down to like 10 people. Almost everyone left, uh, and uh, we didn't have money. To be very frank, we didn't have money. You know, we just uh, said, what should we do? I mean, just. It came, at that point of time, it came to your own personal belief that here is something and I will make it happen, right? If you believe in yourself, you decide that I will make it happen, no one can take it away from you, right? I think that is basically was the time I can still remember in October, in November of 2012, when every night, you know, you, I used to get anxiety attack. I would, I would just stand up and say, I will fight, right? I think if you go through a journey, and if you come out of that, and my wife was with me, right? Uh, we both were there. We told ourselves, you know, if you have to go down, let go, let's go down to the bottom as possible, right? You should not stop yourself from going to the bottom, because once you go down to the bottom, everything's up, right? Everything becomes very optimistic for you. Even small things you will do will become very, very, you know, you'll say, okay, I got 10 orders, I got 15 orders, 20 orders. You know, as entrepreneurs, every day, if you can get like these small joys, it actually takes you upwards. So I think one of the best things we did, if we didn't stop ourselves from falling down. And I, 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 don't know, I, you know, I feel that fortunate that we did that. Because if you try to optimize your falling down, you know, you optimize, you, you still have, you're somewhere hanging in the middle with still, you know, some cost which you need to bear. Uh, and, you know, you can't really do anything justice to anyone, right? So I still remember, like, from, like, 
at that point of time, it was big money, you know, half a crore of burn every cost every month. We came down to two lakh rupees of cost. Uh, and uh, everything, everything came down to basics. You know, basics of business, you need to generate cash. Business is not about throwing money. Business is about generating cash value to the customer, right? And, and once you start thinking of the business that way, you know, a lot of things starts becoming very, very natural for you, right? So you would go down to basics. You would say, I would focus on how do I get the organic traffic, right? So within one year, literally we did PhD on SEO. PhD on SEO. We, we, we went down to the minute, you know, the most detail possible you can find in SEO and we, for all the ethnic keywords, we are on the top, right? That, that basically gave us that curve upside which allowed us to generate cash, it allowed us to become profitable, it allowed us to really go through the time of 2012, 2013, up to the mid of 2014, almost like a journey where you are on your own, right? Uh, we sold a house just to make sure, you know, we can uh, fund it if needed. And in October of 2014 is when we actually got the inflection point. And, uh, and believe me, if once you see that inflection point, is the point which almost like magic for you. you know, how did it happen? Right? Uh, and if you can get to that, and you will never know. You can, as an entrepreneur, you can never predict when that inflection point will come. But it will come. If you stay put, it will come. Uh, so, so basically, in, t in October 2014, just to, just to complete the timeline, uh, we raised a uh, Series B of $18 million uh, from Sakura Capital. Uh, we were very, very lucky. Sakura, you know, believed in us. Uh, and they have been really, really great partner for us uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, and, and just recently, about two months back, we raised our third round of $34 million. Uh, which from, uh, apart from Sakura Capital, we also got Yuri Milner on, on a board. So basically, uh, that's basically the timeline today. Uh, we have grown like more than, uh, you know, more than 10 times, where at one point in time, we had grown like 20 times in the last 12 months, right? One of the fastest growing company, one of the companies which completely under the radar, a lot of people would not have heard of Craftsilla uh, in the last 12 months, but believe me, most of you will hear about Kratzer in the next 12 months to 14 months, right? So uh, that's pretty much a very, very, uh, you know, short, I would say, synopsis of, of Kratzer.com. I'll just uh, run through uh, some more slides just, just to enhance the story. A vision of Kratzer.com is to take societies back to their roots. Sometimes uh, the opportunity is not in the West, sometimes opportunities are East, right? As an entrepreneur, I think if you can think completely out of the, I would say, the linear curve and say, if someone is going A, I want to go B, you probably find a lot more opportunities, you know, when you go on the, on the B path. And I have tracked a lot. I, I, I track a lot. Uh, and whenever I've tracked on the path which is not the track path, I found a lot more beautiful things, right? Uh, and that basically is, is sort of, you know, I want to emphasize that if you want to, if you really as an entrepreneur, if you feel that you really want to do something, think differently. You, know, don't, you don't want to create another Flipkart, Amazon, Uber, you know, it just, you know, it's almost like you can, I mean, it's not like you cannot, uh, but the chances of success and, and the chances that, that you will always get money to create all the, you know, the replicas, it may not happen. Pretty much you have, to, you have to say that, is there a demand, is there opportunity, is there a natural opportunity for me, right, if you really want to create a business. And, and we think that there's a big natural opportunity for us in ethnic because 
Craftsilla, like not, none, none exists like Craftsilla.com globally, right? It's so, it's so, I would say, interesting that there is no Nike of, you know, ethnic, there is no Ni Samsung of ethnic, you know, there, there isn't any big brand in ethnic, right? And, and if you look at it, India is probably the most mainstream ethnic country, right? Pretty much the biggest ethnic country in the world. And we believe that something big will come out of India in ethnic, right? And that's why we believe that we are the fittest player for that. You know? That's why we believe that we can really create something big uh, in ethnic uh, in India. As I told you, we're one of the fastest going e-commerce company in India. Uh, and we are a global company. We are, we are, what we're doing is we are, we're not saying, you know, of course, India is a big country. But wherever the ethnic is, we will go. We want to really create a big ethnic empire. I think India, if India can really create something big, it ha you know, it, it, I personally believe you know, it will be an ethnic and really, you know, we should not leave any stone unturned to really uh, capture that, you know, opportunity. If I have to really lay down the success mantras of Craftsilla.com, uh, basically unique, I talked to you about, you know, it, it's a story which none of you may, you know, uh, may not even relate to or, or very few people will relate to. And, but it's a story which if you realize, if you go deeper, as our investors went deeper, as we went deeper, we realize it's such a unique story. Uh, and, and, and that is basically for you. I mean, a lot of times you will talk about some ideas and you know, a lot of people will not relate to you. But you, you're, you know you have seen that. You know that there's some undercurrents that I believe are very, very interesting here. Uh, so being, being unique, I think, is one of the biggest success mantra of Castle.com, capital efficiency. One of the, one of the, I think one of the most important aspects of, of Craftsler.com, what we learned as we went down, was how to really build something in a very capital efficient way, right? For us, every rupee matters, because we have seen that how hard it is to get that rupee, right? Uh, having said that, you also don't want to be, you know, penny wise, you know, pound foolish, right? So, so you have to literally, you have to literally behave in the conditions you are, right? So today, although capital efficiency is important, I would not want to sacrifice my scale. Right? So, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting equation always. It's a multivariate equation, right? How do you, how do you lower, how do you get to a higher scale, really having a cost? capital efficient uh, business model and and when, uh, when you put that constraints and then we start thinking solutions starts coming out and 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 that's how that's how we think you know when, I, when someone comes to me and this is how I want to do and this is this is the kind of money you want to spend I tell them here is the budget can you show me magic happen for the same kind of goals you have right uh, and that helps that helps uh, and that has helped crafts.com a lot of course, a global approach uh, is very interesting for us that we want to really go deeper into different countries. So, although I would caution myself a lot of times that, you know, let's not do things which can divert you know, attention from a lot of other important things which are happening in, in India, right? So, this is a, it's a different balance you have to play, but uh, but you know the opportunity is something we're looking at is global in nature, and focus and persistence. I think from whatever I have talked at you know till till this hour, you might have realized that focus and persistence is something which what you know took us to where we are today, and it is going to be again what we will take will you know what will take us from here to a billion dollar, two billion dollar, ten billion dollar valuation kind of company we are looking at. And, and I think I pretty much touched upon the phases of Craftsler.com. It's pretty much an impulsive start, right? I personally believe that none of the insights in the data can tell you where the opportunity is. Opportunity is all about observation. You know, you literally need to observe, you know, sometimes you'll see, okay, this is, this is a pain point which is someone has, and here is the opportunity, right? None of the data points will tell you. None of the, none of the you know, uh, research report will tell you all that. 
So, uh, so most of times, good, good entrepreneurs, successful companies are built out pretty much a very impulsive start. You know, whereas okay, there is opportunity, let's start. If you think about too much, if you want to, you know, pro and cons and everything, if you start doing that, you, you probably will not end up starting that company. The second phase of Craftsla was foundation build up. The third is where we are today, is scale build up. And the fourth journey for Craftsla will be where we build a brand. You know, we literally take Craftsla as a brand uh, in ethnic space. But these are the few things. Uh, I'll tell you when, when, when we were, uh, when we were at the lowest point. These are the five analogies of life which really helped, you know, as personally for me to get out of, uh, of, of really the, the bottom, bottom level where we were. Right? And these, these are basically the analogies I, I, when I looked at different, you know, simple things in life, I said, what can I learn from these, right? And, and, and what can I learn and how, because because these are so natural in nature, right? This happens in nature. A lot of, a lot of things you can learn, right? So, for example, ghee, right? Uh, if you, if you ever, you know, have seen how ghee is made, right? You, if you, you need to churn and churn and churn and churn and churn, and suddenly you realize that you know, it has started to become ghee. Right? Uh, so, two things, right? A, the persistence of churn. You really need to churn and churn and churn, right? And second thing is, which is I think the most important thing, you can never predict when the ghee will come. Right? You can never predict your success. You literally have to churn and churn and suddenly you have to believe in yourself that ghee will come. Right? So I think that, that is something you know, which happened with Craftsilla. The fan analogy, right? If you look at the fan, you know, you, if, you, if you ever you know, turn on the fan, you never think the damn thing will never start. It always starts. You know, why is it that fan can last for 30, 40, 50 years? I still go to my ancestor's house. The old fan is still there. And it still turns on, right? And, and if you think of it, why you know, it, it does that? Fan is probably the most simplest of the machines. Right? It's, it basically has a, a round direction. There's no uh, you know, very smooth. This environment is very smooth, right? Something which fan tells you is to keep things simple, never overcomplicate. Right? In your business, if you keep things very, very simple, it will take you the longest way. If you try to do a lot of things, a lot of complicated things, believe me, businesses get built by doing very, very simple things. Keep it very, very simple. Don't, don't overcomplicate. Don't make it like air conditioned. Don't, don't make it like a uh, you know, big, uh, uh, big machine. Uh, the Banyan analogy, I think a lot of people know Banyan, right? It just is, is the most fundamental analogy I can think of, is that before the Banyan goes up, it grows down, right? You really need to grow down before you go up. Right? You really need to build your foundation. If you really grow up too fast without building a foundation, you literally, uh, you know, at least in a, you know, in, a, in a startup journey, that can be really, really damaging, right? Paneer analogy, right? Uh, paneer is something, you know, which tells you if, you, if you know how paneer is made, right? The paneer tells you that if, if someone really tears you apart, you have to become more valuable than what you were, right? So paneer is more valuable than the milk, right? After someone tears you apart, you have to become more valuable, you know, than what you were, right? And that basically is something we as, you know, Craftsilla learned, you know, when someone teared us apart, uh, the, the environment, the people, you know, the society, you know, people, people discourage you. You literally have to come down, come out, and become like a paneer and say, "I want to, I want to really become more valuable." And the crap analogy. Basically, if, if you look, if you look at a child, right, a child grows up not when, uh, not when he starts to learn, he or she starts to learn eating, but when he starts to control the crap, the shit. That is basically when you know how to deal with the crap in your life, in your business, is when you have grown as an entrepreneur. I think that's something 
is, is personally I have learned. I have gone through a lot of, you know, as it goes up and down, you deal with a lot of crap. And, and once you know how to deal with it, you literally have grown, uh, uh, have, uh, grown as an entrepreneur. Not when you have scaled your business, not when you are scaling or burning cash or, or you know, um, or scaling up or doing, you know, 10, 20 countries expansion. No, no, not that. Some of the few things which uh, I thought uh, will helpful. And, and recently, you know, I wrote an article that theory of constraints for entrepreneurs. And pretty much, the, was pretty much the summary is that if you define a table to dance, if you say this is the table and I want to dance on it, you literally can create the kind of dance forms you yourself cannot, you know, think about it, right? So when you say this is my constraint and I want to create a billion dollar valuation, this is my constraint. My constraint is what? My constraint is I will never burn cash. My constraint is that I will be most capital efficient. My constraint is that ethnic, right? Uh, my constraint is my location, right? My constraints are that, you know, I, w I don't want to grow like a thousand, two thousand, five thousand people team, right? Once I have defined my constraints, then I will start thinking, now how do I create magic, right? I think one of the, one of the important things which as, as an entrepreneur I learned from Craftsula journey is, is that, you know, define a constraint and literally if you define your constraints, the magic will happen. And just few few pointers, uh, and I think I pretty much talked about this. Like which opportunity exists everywhere. Observation was insight based. Uh, opportunity spotting. Go out of the context. A lot of times you have to go out of the context. You know, if you, if you if 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 I, if you have to build something, uh, let's say for example, I am not from handicrafts, but I was building something in handicrafts. Because I went out of the context. I said. Oh my goodness, there's so much of handicraft lying around, you know, why, why no one is doing it, right? If I was a craftsman, I probably cannot build craftsula, to be very frank. Of course, passion is important, be personal, focus, simple, complex business models really work. Believe me, don't overcomplicate your business model. Craftsula business model is very, very simple, 20% commission flat. We don't say category-wise those kind of stuff. We don't have any other revenue model. Very, very simple. You are Craftsula, 20% commission is what you will get. This is what I will deduct and those kind of stuff. Uh, there's no, it's a marketplace, no retail, nothing. This is pretty much the most simplest business model you can think of is what we, what we have. And of course, scalable systems and businesses. You have to think scalability. Any time you do anything, you have to think, what am I doing? Is it scalable? A lot, believe me, a lot of things you will you will you 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 will just say I will not do, and which are probably the right things to uh, to do is because they're not scalable, right? And my message, you know, my last message to everyone is become an entrepreneur, man. It's a beautiful journey. I, I really I've really enjoyed uh, as an entrepreneur after becoming a VC, and of course I was an entrepreneur before. But this, this gives you immense happiness because it, it in, in some way transforms you, you know, uh, it, it it's in some ways makes you more human. It's in some ways, you know, makes you better individual and how do you deal with problems, how do you deal with people, how do you deal with, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, how do you deal with societal pressure? And I, I, I dealt with a lot of societal pressure. My father said, boss, you are from PhD, you know, IIT Bombay, you know, all this, you know, MBA. And you know, what are you doing, starting handicrafts? You know, just, you know, everyone, almost everyone laughed at us, to be very frank. Uh, but, but, you know, as a temporary, you start to deal with it. You say, I, I don't care, I'm here to build something big. So that's it. Uh, I think that's pretty much the Kraftsla story. Uh, any questions you have? I'm Shiva here. Oh, when I hear crafts, I always think it is in the villages where they have no access to tech, no access to even uh, transportations, at the, down, uh, the lowest levels of the society. 
and your uh, business is built upon uh, such areas. Is my assumption correct that uh, you still have to deal with such uh, uh, places and such people who are sitting in the lowest levels of the society and then uh, make a big business out of it? Yeah, so basically, uh, when we started Craftsilla, we focused on only on handicrafts, right? Uh, when, we, when we realized that the voice of customer, so one of the things which we, which we do in Craftsilla is always look at the voice of customer. You know, whenever I try to be smart in business from a customer's point of view, customer slapped me, to be very frank. You know, uh, cust when I said this sari or this salwar suit or this thing is what customer will like, actually customer likes something else which you actually kind of don't believe actually customer like that, right? So actually, uh, when, we, when we saw that handicrafts is not something which a lot of people are buying, we said, let's broaden it to ethnic. You know, let's really make ourselves the biggest play in ethnic and not constraints all only to handicrafts, right? So of course, a lot of our, uh, a lot of, a lot of our sellers are small time artisans, NGOs and artisans. Uh, um, uh, and and uh, but we also have a lot of people who are housewives, designers, boutiques, small shopkeepers, uh, those kind of stuff. Profile of our sellers are smaller. These are you know a lot of our actually sixty percent of our sellers are women selling from home and boutiques and stuff. Right. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, so so to answer your question, yes, we have. Uh, we, we still have a lot of sellers who are small, but I wouldn't say the whole ecosystem is that, uh, of the whole seller ecosystem. I have a follow-up actually, if you can. So, uh, yeah, as please. you had the rare gift of actually seeing things as an entrepreneur and as a VC, so I would like to know where do you think uh, Indian start startup ecosystem is heading in the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months? The, the startup ecosystem. So basically, to me, if you, if you have to uh, ask me, today is the best time to start a company. Right? We, I have seen a lot of ups and downs, 2007 to 2008, or like a lot of rush. You know, a lot of companies came up, a lot of capital deployed. 2008, 2009, everything went up. Again, 2010, 2011, Again, you know, and then 2012, 2013, again down. And 2014, 2015, up. Next two years will be down. But the best companies, if you look at it, came out. Almost everyone started. If I can think of Mintra, Flipkart, Snapdeal, started in 2008, 2009 era. Right? They started. Most of these people start when the things are down. Our best time was when we were down, 2013, 2014, right? And then. Once you have the up, then you ride the wave, right? You never want to start when it's going up. Believe me, that's, that's probably one out of 100 people who are lucky to get out of it and really make successful. Uh, but if you build your business for in the downturn, when no, when things are, you have to, you can make it, when you can be focused, when you're just, you know, doing really building the foundation, and then when the upside will come, I think, so to me, 2016, 2017 are the, is going to be a, a year of a lot of turbulence, a lot of things, but the best companies of 2018, 2019 will come out of 2016. Uh, hi. There's so much pressure on scaling. How do you avoid premature scaling? There's so much pressure of scaling. Yeah. So yeah. Everybody says building scalable models, so yeah. how do you avoid premature scaling? Premature scaling, hap uh, it happened in our case also. We, so if you look at the phases of growth, uh, as I mentioned, right? Uh, it's an impulsive start, then basically build the foundation and scaling, right? Usually a lot of people take out the foundation part and start, they start, then the next phase is the scaling part. And, and of course we also made that mistake uh, but it's up to you, basically, uh, how do you want to deal it, right? Uh, I have clearly communicated to my investors, I'm not building it for you, right? Uh, I tell them, I'm not building for you. And they're fine with it because I'll tell you, if you're not building for them, you probably build the best company possible, right? And which is what they want. They, they're not looking that, you know, you present yourselves 
uh, on paper to this guy, you know, you really want to have create a very substantial company. And, and to believe me, no, nothing happens in two, three, four years unless you're really building a very tech company in India. Unfortunately, the big brands or big companies, or everything takes like eight to 10 years. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're thinking wonders will happen to you in two, three years, uh, those are rare situations of last 12 to 18 months. It, it has never, I have seen as a VC, in 2007, 2009, 2010, raising a series of 3 million was, oh my goodness, I've raised so much of money. Right? Today, series of 20 million has no value, right? But, but it's not like things have changed, not like India, the basic conditions of India, the big opportunity of India has changed so much, right? So pretty much you will uh, again get into an era where, you know, 5 million will be a big money, right? Uh, so you have to prepare for that. So scaling is unfortunately, as if you're venture funded, you, you will have pressure. I'm telling you, I, I cannot deny that I don't have that pressure, right? But it's up to you how do you want to deal it, uh, how do you want to create the business which has scale. Uh, it requires magic, it requires a lot of work. I just wanted to go off of that. Um, you said you had a startup in San Diego, yeah. and then you went into VC, and now you're back in the startup. Yeah. How do you think that it changed your mindset going from, first of all, going from startup to VC, and then coming back into this realm, but having the experience of having the VC side? How do you think that's changed your mindset? So, yeah, so basically, I'll tell you, as a VC, few things which you learn which are important, um, and which, which, which uh, basically helps you uh, in, uh, when you're building a company. A is uh, the, the importance of team, right? As a, as a VC, you know, we, we used to say that, you know, and, and it's still true that we only invest in teams, not in business models or not in business ideas and stuff, right? So team is critically important. Uh, then scale, scalability is important. So one of the lenses which I used, uh, which I learned in a VC was scalability, right? Everything I do from my, like, if I have to merchandise, right? If I have to create a merchandising model of how do I merchandise products on Craftsert.com, you know, I can do it by having like 10 merchandisers, or I can create a model which is very scalable, right? Uh, where, you know, it's more machine-based, more technology-based, those kind of stuff, right? So I would rather do that rather than do this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the last 12 to 18 months, you'll see more of that, right? The people who say they're, they're food tech companies, but they have like 3,000, 5,000 people, right? What is tech in that in 5,000 people? You need to ask, right? So, so, so scalability is something, uh, you know, you need, uh, that I learned as, a, as an entrepreneur, as, as a VC, right? Something VC will never teach you is how do you deal with practical situations, right? They will never teach you. I, I know as a, as a board member, as a board for three companies, I used to ask questions as an entrepreneur, I'll never ask them co these questions, right? You know, what kind of silly questions are you asking? I think of that, right? Uh, there are a lot of things which are so practical, you know, you just can't, as a VC, you just don't get it, right? So, uh, and that, unfortunately, as an entrepreneur only, you can learn, right? How do you deal with people, right? Is it easy to say, build a great tech, great team? How do you build a team, right? Uh, because the high flyers don't want to, join your early stage company uh, and you don't believe in low flyers, you know, the, the foot soldiers are almost meaningless for VCs, right? So, and to believe me, you know, my most valuable people have been foot soldiers. You know, that's something which, you know, I learned. So, yeah, so that, those are the few, you know, both have their own learnings, you know, Helps you somewhere, doesn't help you somewhere. Hi, sir. Hello. Sticking on, uh, sticking to the topic of scalability, what I have observed in uh, Craftsvilla is that you have scaled up without even, um, you know, uh, building a consumer proposition. So, mm. yes, you are saying ethnic, but why should it be the brand of choice for me to, or any other consumer who, who you are targeting? to go and buy ethnic there and there is a little bit of a mixture there yeah. you start off uh, being you know about crafts and handicrafts and indian crafts and now when i go on to crafts villa all i see is you know what i would see in a sari shop or a <laughs> yeah. a manewar for yeah, example yeah. 
So it's not about wedding. It's not about. I, I, I'm, I'm a little confused on your consumer positioning and how sure. do you think you will scale if, if you still don't have that positioning? Yes. Yeah, so basically, as an entrepreneur, I'll tell you, you always the best. The best way to scale is to scale at your low-hanging fruits, right? So for us, the low-hanging fruits was ethnic fashion, right? So so we hung on to that. We said there's so much of natural demand for ethnic fashion that you know let's scale with that as the low-hanging fruit. Right? The next 12 months of Chrysler journey is going to be journey of of getting deeper into other categories, right? So you'll see a lot more of Ayurvedic products, you'll see a lot of spiritual products, you'll see a lot of handicrafts, you'll see a lot of uh, home furnishing, carpet, shawls, stoles, you'll see a lot of, uh, you know, bath and beauty, herbal, natural bath and beauty, right? Well, ethnic is so broad, if you look at ethnic, almost, you know, when we define ethnic is the, whatever is the IP of this country, whatever the country has created over 500,000 years is ethnic for us, right? So pretty much, the history of whatever the country has created is, is the mark, is the opportunity we have, right? So that's why you see today, what you see, what what you will see next 12 months is going to be a lot more mixture of different things. Yeah. Uh, sir, your company is essentially a B2C company. Yeah. Uh, do you see any opportunity in B2B space? One, two, uh, as per your company. Second, how do you see B2B space coming up in the next five years or ten years? B2B. Yeah. So B2B unfortunately doesn't lend itself well for for online businesses, right? So that's why you will not find a lot of B2B businesses unless they're like uh, classified businesses, right? Uh, other than that, uh, for transactional businesses you will not find B2B. Simply because B2B requires a lot of interaction, it's not an impulsive purchase, it requires a lot of negotiation. Unfortunately, online platform is not made for that. If someone can crack it. Yeah, definitely, uh, you know, that's the opportunity. But because of the inherent nature of how B2B operates is different. So we don't have any B2B, unfortunately, we are completely B2C. Uh, sorry, one last question, please. Yeah. Uh, so I have a very personal question to ask you. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm at a stage where, you know, uh, I'm already a CXO of a company and things like that. I'm used to a certain lifestyle. What do you do to, you know, take that plunge because it's a difficult decision. You know, you're used to a certain lifestyle, you know, money hitting the bank is the, the worst drug that you can get. Uh, but what do you, you know, what is that trigger that, you know, pushes you that, okay, I will be okay with leaving this lifestyle, but try to create something bigger than what I am capable of. So I'll tell you when, when, when we started, uh, you know, me and my wife both sto sold the house we owned, right? And the question we ask, you know, whether we should own a palace or we should own the house, right? It's something that you need to ask yourself, right? Do you want to, do you want to be in a three-bedroom house or do you want to be in a palace, right? And if, we, if you want to be in a palace, unfortunately, you have to leave your three-bedroom house, right? So, uh, it's, it's up, it, as an entrepreneur, you, you have to have that, you know, that belief and that vision and that, that you want to do that because this is not acceptable to me, right? So, Unfortunately, the very, very personal choice, which uh, I can't influence, something you need to influence yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>